Okay, this is dealing with the uh, female reproductive system, so we're looking at the uh, other half of sexual reproduction. So we're going to do the same thing for female reproductive that we did for male reproductive, okay? Talk about the anatomy and the physiology. The role of the female reproductive system is to produce eggs, secrete hormones, and also nurture and protect the developing embryo, fetus, and neonate during the nine months of pregnancy. So the female obviously has a bigger job. The gonads in the female are inside the body instead of outside the body and they are not physically attached to the rest of the reproductive system. Okay, There is a gap between the fallopian tubes and the rest of the reproductive duct work in the female and that leaves open the possibility for um, pathogens to get into the abdominal pelvic cavity. That's something called PID or pelvic inflammatory disease and it also allows for the possibility of uh, endometriosis where the inner lining of the uterus escapes and populates the uh, abdominal pelvic cavity and cycles with the menstrual cycle as well as the possibility of ectopic pregnancy in which the egg does not make it to the fallopian tube and instead falls in the abdominal pelvic cavity and is um, could be fertilized by a sperm and implant outside the uterus okay and that's something in which we have to intervene with laparoscopic surgery to remove the implant so that the mother doesn't bleed to death. Okay, so let's look at a little bit of the female reproductive. The ovaries are the female gonads. They are the primary female sex organs. Their main job is to produce ova. These female sex cells are also known as eggs. Eggs produce the female sex hormones estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is the female sex hormone responsible for female puberty and the maturation of the reproductive system. And progesterone acts with estrogen to develop the breasts and jumpstart menstruation. It also maintains the right environment in the uterus for implantation and growth of a zygote. Just like males, females also have a duct system. It's made up of three structures the uterine tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. The uterine or fallopian tubes cordially receive and conduct the ovum from the ovaries and toward the uterus. They also provide fantastic sites where fertilization takes place. The uterus is a hollow organ with thick walls. It is the site of implantation of a zygote. Remember, a zygote is formed in the fallopian tubes and housed in the uterus. That means its job is to receive, retain, and nourish a completely fertilized egg. The uterus leads into the vagina through an opening called the cervix. These layers are the parametrium, which is the outer layer, the myometrium, which is the thick muscular middle layer, and the endometrium, which is the inner layer. The endometrium is the side where embryos are implanted. Yep, that's where the zygote latches on. The superior or upper sublayer of the endometrium is called the functional layer. This is the layer that crumbles away during menstruation. Don't worry. The wall of the endometrium is eventually regenerated and replaced by an underlying sublayer called the basal layer. So it can fall off all over again and again and again. The third duct is the vagina. The vagina is a thin walled tube that is the female copulatory organ. The vagina is also a passageway for baby delivery and menstrual flow. The female external genitalia, or vulva, is made up of the mons pubis, the labia majora, the labia minora, the vestibule, and the clitoris. The mons pubis is a fatty round area overlying the pubic bone. After puberty, it is covered with pubic hair. The labia majora are pigmented, hair-covered, outer fatty skin folds. They are located posterior to or behind the mons pubis. The mons pubis is the female answer to the scrotum. The labia minora is a thin, delicate, inner fold covered with a thin layer of mucous membrane and oil. They're completely enclosed by the labia majora. The vestibule is an inner region completely enclosed by the labia minora. This area contains the greater and lesser vestibular glands. These glands are kind of like the bulbo glands in the male reproductive system. They release mucus into the vestibule in order to lubricate it during sexual intercourse. The clitoris is the last part of the female external genitalia that we'll talk about. The clitoris is a female erectile organ that's kind of like the penis. It's the main structure that contributes to female arousal. 
The clitoris is a protruding structure made up of erectile tissue. It has two roots and, like the penis, it also has a shaft. The clitoris is full of sensory nerve endings, so, like the penis, the clitoris is sensitive to the touch. In fact, if it helps your memorization, you can think of the clitoris as a mini penis. Or if it suits you, the penis could be a jumbo clitoris. The breasts are also sometimes discussed with a female external genitalia. Female breasts contain a number of structures that are really important if you want to nourish a newborn baby. These structures are the mammary glands and the nipples. The mammary glands are modified sweat glands contained inside the breasts. They produce the milk that nourishes a newborn baby. The milk is produced by small glands and then carried to the nipples by a system of ducts. The nipple is the structure that ejects milk. The areola is the center section of the breast that surrounds the nipple. It contains sebaceous glands which produce oil that prevents the nipple from drying up and cracking. The areola is pigmented and darkens during pregnancy. This dark area is like a marker that helps the infants locate the milk. We've come to the end. To the fallopian tubes, um, thus leaving the risk of the, um, the previous conditions that we discussed. The entire um, setup is held into place by ligaments, um, the suspensory ligament, which uh, stabilizes the position of the fallopian tubes, the uh, round ligament and uterosacral ligament, um, which stabilize the position of the uterus, okay, um, and the broad ligament, which stabilizes the position of the uterus and the fallopian tubes, and the ovarian ligament, which stabilizes the position of the ovary, okay. Um, as long as those structures are intact, um, the reproductive apparatus will stay inside the female's body. Um, however, in older women, sometimes the muscle tone of the uterus declines and the connective tissue that latches everything into place becomes slack and you can have something called a prolapse in which the uterus actually comes outside the body and of course it has to be put back in its place to avoid infection. Now, with meiosis, um, this is something that, that we looked at in the male, okay? It also happens in the female, but in the female, instead of happening 24-7, happening 365 from puberty until death, okay, meiosis begins uh, before puberty and does not really end until the last egg leaves the last ovary, and that's a process called... Uh, menarche. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry, that's a process called menopause. So a woman's reproductive window is from menarche, her first menstrual period, to menopause, her last menstrual period. And the gametes that she produces don't become fully haploid until they're ovulated and fertilized. Okay, if they never get ovulated and, or fertilized, um, they fail to complete meiosis and either die in a process known as atresia or they're, they're ovulated and they pass through the woman's reproductive system unfertilized and she doesn't even realize that it happened, okay? So a woman is born with a finite number of eggs in her ovaries and once the last egg leaves the last ovary, her natural reproductive window has ended. Now, the length of that window varies according to a variety of factors. Number one, how many eggs she's born with. Number two, how many eggs she ovulates per month. Okay, some women ovulate more than one egg a month. All right, um, whether or not she uses progesterone-based birth control. Okay, because if she does, then her cycles will stop, and she will hold on to her eggs until much later in life. Okay, um, I think I may have mentioned that the oldest mother on record is uh, was seventy. Okay, and she was an example of. Uh, somebody who went off birth control, okay? And uh, the youngest mother was only five years old, and that did not happen in this country. Um, and it was an example of a condition called precocious puberty in which the female began cycling too soon because the hypothalamus loses the inhibition normally produced by low levels of estrogen and progesterone. She began cycling much sooner than the typical female. Okay. and of course, as a result, was capable of pregnancy, right? Follicle-stimulating hormone in the female does exactly what it's described, right? It causes follicles in the ovary um, to begin to mature, okay? Uh, about 24 a month in an average female, you know, there can be more or fewer 
okay? And of those, um, only one generally ovulates, and then the rest die in that process I mentioned earlier called atresia, okay? Uh, luteinizing hormone is a little bit different. Luteinizing hormone's job is to um, cause the production of the corpus luteum, which is the follicle cells that remain in the ovary after ovulation. And what the um, formation of the corpus luteum does is it promotes the, uh, the production of large amounts of progesterone and some estrogen through the first trimester in order to maintain the uterine lining and prevent ovulation of another egg. Okay, The uh, corpus luteum eventually will uh, degenerate into the corpus albicans, which is no longer a hormone secreting structure. Um, if there is an implant, this will happen towards the end of the first trimester. If there is no implant, um, it will happen generally um, after the uh, the end of the one month cycle, okay, if not sooner. Um, the way to know whether or not you have a, an implant in a potential pregnancy is to check the urine for the production of human chorionic gonadotrophin, which is a product of the chorion, which is the stalk that connects the embryo to the uterus, um, specifically the endometrium of the uterus, okay. Ovarian hormones such as estrogen promote the maturation of eggs and makes the female look female and promotes the production of secondary sex characteristics such as the maturation of reproductive organs and breast tissue, fat distribution, widening of the pelvis and menstruation, as well as closure of the epiphyseal discs and the long bones. Okay. Um, ovarian hormones include estrogen and progesterone as well as testosterone. Men and women make all three. It's just that men make more testosterone than estrogen and progesterone, and women make more estrogen and progesterone than testosterone. At menopause, estrogen levels drop. Possible changes that accompany this include the absence of menstruation, the weakening of ligaments that support the breasts, the redistribution of fat, a drop in hematocrit, a drop in bone density, a drop in muscle mass. Okay. Progesterone works with estrogen to establish the menstrual cycle and maintain pregnancy and also prepares the breasts for milk production after pregnancy. Okay. The genital tract in the female is made up of the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. Okay. And because of this, you can see how there's a pathway for pathogens to get inside the abdominal pelvic cavity. Um, if, you, if you trace the pathway here, okay, um, it's easy to visualize, and let's do this in a light color so it's easy to see. Come on, let's do a yellow. Pop up. There we go. So you, you imagine, you know, that you, you get a pathogen coming through the vaginal orifice, okay? And uh, why, why are we drifting all over the place here? Let's get you off. You drift, you drift through the vaginal orifice, okay, you go up through the cervix, keep going, go up through the cervix, okay, why, 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 okay, go up through the cervix, okay, uh, I don't know why we're drifting all over the place here, let's, let's do this, let's just unplug you. Maybe it's easier to do here. Anyway, up, up through the vagina, okay, through the cervix, through the fallopian tube, and then finally um, into the abdominal pelvic cavity. Okay, so out this way. Okay, so you can see the entrance in and the entrance out. Okay. It's acting all wonky. There, there, I'll hit there. There. Okay. So that's that's the pathway. Okay. Um, 
The fimbriae are the fringed ends of the distal parts of the fallopian tube and their role is to capture the egg and also to stroke the ovary to promote ovulation, to pop that mature follicle and release the, uh, the egg along with the, um, the corona radiata, which are um, follicular cells that help protect the egg and disguise it from the woman's immune system. Um, remember that they are not physically attached to the ovary. You know, there's a gap between the ovary and the fallopian tube. Um, it, it's generally near there that fertilization takes place, okay? And then we help to carry the ovum to the uterus by several mechanisms, right? There's pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium that lines the uh, fallopian tube, okay? And helps to sweep the egg towards the uterus. There's smooth muscle contraction that helps it along as well. And if sperm has managed to attach to the outside of the egg, they help to paddle the egg towards the uterus as well, okay? So you've got you get several um, processes that help that take place. Right? Now sometimes what can happen, um, we, we sort of discussed earlier, is that you can have implantation outside the uterus because the egg fails to attach uh, or uh, be, be captured by the fallopian tube. And then it can be fertilized and implant outside the uterus. That's an ectopic pregnancy. You can also have the egg get blocked in the fallopian tube and get fertilized by sperm, and that's a tubal pregnancy, another type of ectopic pregnancy. Um, and in both cases, the implant has to be removed so that it doesn't develop and cause the mother to bleed to death. Okay. Um, now, for those who are curious, all right, um, it has been accomplished. It's not a typical procedure that you can get in any hospital, but we have managed... Um, as a as a point of research to remove those implants and put them in the uterus and have them develop a term okay um, there there have been papers that have reported that but like I said that's not a it's not a typical medical procedure that you can request at your local hospital that's likely something that's being developed okay PID we talked about right pathogens have a clear path into the abdominal pelvic cavity where they can set up infection okay the uterus itself is made up of the fundus, the body, and the cervix. The layers are the endometrium, the myometrium, and the parametrium, and it is connected physically to the vagina and the fallopian tubes. Okay? The endometrium is glandular epithelium, which secretes um, uterine milk to nourish the blastocyst upon arrival in the uterus for about three days before it implants. The myometrium, of course, is smooth muscle, and the parametrium is connective tissue that helps to latch the organ into place. Okay, The birth canal uh, is bounded by the fornices and penetrated by the cervix. It's where we take a pap smear to check for um, irregular tissue such as cancer tissue. Um, the rugae in the vagina are folds that stretch out to accommodate the baby and also to accommodate intercourse. And the hymen is an incomplete membrane around the vaginal orifice that can rupture as a result of either intercourse or physical activity. Okay, um, Generally speaking, um, birth uh, is accomplished when we have uh, full dilation or crowning at 10 centimeters, um, then we can proceed with the, uh, the rest of the birth process. Okay, So um, definitely um, that's going to require some compensation by the vagina. Okay. The vulva is made up of the labia majora, menorah, the mons pubis, the clitoris, and vestibule. Also the urethra, the opening of Bartholin's glands, the perineum, and the vagina. Okay. Um, some women, uh, after menopause, have the, um, the organ system removed, and that is a condition, as it's an operation called a hysterectomy. Um, it, it varies in terms of what you want removed. A, a radical hysterectomy, we remove the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. Um, then there's variations in which we may just remove the uterus and fallopian tubes, sometimes just the uterus. Okay, It all depends on family history and the desire of the patient. Okay? Hormonal control of the reproductive cycle involves a number of hormones, and unlike male hormones, the female hormonal secretion occurs in a monthly cycle, where, as in men, it's it's pretty much a it cycles throughout the day, 
Okay, a regular pattern of increase and decrease in hormone levels um, is observed. Okay, the purpose of the female reproductive cycle is to mature an egg monthly for fertilization. The cycles that work together are the ovarian and the uterine cycle and they typically take 28 days. So there's a first half of the cycle which is 14 and a second half which is another 14. So let's take a look. The major structures of the female reproductive system are the two ovaries, two fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. A normal female is capable of reproducing from the onset of menstruation during puberty until the end of menopause. The female is fertile and able to become pregnant approximately during the 13th and 14th days of each menstrual cycle. The total number of eggs a woman will produce in her lifetime are present in her ovaries when she is born. Each month at the beginning of a menstrual cycle, the pituitary gland secretes the follicle-stimulating hormone, which is commonly known as FSH. This hormone stimulates one egg to mature with an ovary. The maturing egg is surrounded by a graphene follicle. On the 13th or 14th day of the menstrual cycle, the graphene follicle ruptures and releases the mature egg from the ovary. Because the fallopian tube is not attached to the ovary, the finger-like fimbriae must catch the egg and guide it into the fallopian tube. After the release of the egg, the graphene follicle changes and becomes the corpus luteum, which secretes the hormone progesterone in preparation of the lining of the uterus to support a pregnancy. If the egg is not fertilized, the corpus luteum dies and the progesterone secretion ceases. The menstrual cycle is then completed with a menstrual period. If the egg is fertilized as it travels down the fallopian tube, the corpus luteum continues to produce progesterone. The fertilized egg moves into the uterus where it is implanted. The placenta forms and, for the duration of the pregnancy, it secretes the progesterone required to maintain the pregnancy. Throughout the 40 weeks of the pregnancy, necessary nutrients are supplied and waste products are removed by the placenta and the umbilical cord. When it is time for the baby to be born, the pituitary gland secretes the hormone oxytocin. This hormone stimulates the labor contractions that result in the birth of the child. After the infant has been delivered, the final stage is the delivery of the placenta as the afterbirth. To understand the various ways that medical science can assist reproduction, it is important to understand how the reproductive system functions in both sexes, because the cause of infertility often lies equally with both men and women. The main players in the female reproductive cycle are the pituitary gland, the ovaries, and the uterus. Their activities are closely coordinated. Each month, one or other ovary releases a single egg, an event known as ovulation. It is brought about by a series of complex interactions between the pituitary gland, the ovaries, and the uterus. The pituitary gland is itself under the control of this small area of the brain known as the hypothalamus. A new menstrual cycle begins when the nerve cells of this center secrete a hormone called gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, GNRH, into the network of blood vessels which surrounds the pituitary gland. Stimulated by pulses of gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, Cells in the pituitary gland secrete another hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. FSH travels in the bloodstream, reaching the ovaries. There it stimulates the formation and growth of an ovarian follicle in one or other ovary. The follicle consists of an egg, a number of surrounding cells which secrete estrogen hormones, and fluid. FSH helps the egg to mature and prepares it for release. As the follicle matures, the hypothalamus increases secretion of GnRH. This in turn stimulates the pituitary to secrete a second hormone which acts on the ovary. This is luteinizing hormone, or LH. Toward the middle of the cycle, there is a sudden peak in the blood level of LH. This acts as the trigger for ovulation. Within minutes of its release, the egg is guided by suction through the fringed opening of the outer end of the fallopian tube, 
starting it on a journey which will take five or six days as it passes down the tube and finally reaches the cavity of the uterus. Meanwhile, after the follicle ruptures, it is converted into this yellowish body known as the corpus luteum. Cells of the corpus luteum secrete the hormone progesterone, which brings about important changes in the lining of the uterus, preparing it for possible pregnancy. In fact, the lining of the uterus, known as the endometrium, undergoes changes in response to hormone levels during the cycle. In the first half of the cycle, known as the follicular phase, the developing follicle secretes increasing amounts of estrogen hormone, which encourages regeneration of the endometrium. After ovulation, there are important changes in the endometrium, aimed at making it suitable to receive a fertilized egg. These changes are brought about by a secretion of progesterone from the corpus luteum. The secretion of progesterone is maintained for several days, but if the egg is not fertilized in that time, the corpus luteum withers, and falling levels of progesterone and estrogen trigger the shedding of the uterine lining as the menstrual flow. The cycle then starts again. But if the egg is fertilized, no menstruation occurs as the corpus luteum continues to function secreting progesterone during the first three months of the pregnancy. Thereafter, numerous changes occur to support the developing embryo. So in the follicular phase of the ovarian cycle, the gonadotropins from the anterior pituitary in charge of it are FSH and LH. FSH triggers the maturation of the follicle and the ovum. The follicle secretes estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen nourishes the ovum and the uterine lining. At the mid-cycle surge of LH and FSH, we see ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum. Okay? The ovarian cycle drives the uterine cycle. Okay? Um, the ovarian cycle has both an early follicular and a luteal phase. Ovulation separates them. Right? It's the formation of the corpus luteum that establishes the luteal phase. During the follicular phase, the egg undergoes meiosis up to um, metaphase of meiosis um, 1. All right? Both egg and follicle develop into the graphene follicle. Estrogen dominates the follicular phase. It nourishes the ovum and starts to build up the uterine lining. At the end of the follicular phase, there is a mid-cycle surge of LH causing ovulation. Okay. The extruded egg is sucked into the fallopian tube. Now, at that point, all right, right before ovulation, the egg is in metaphase of meiosis two, okay, and will not complete it until it is fertilized. Okay, so if if the egg is never um, fertilized, it will be frozen in metaphase of meiosis two after ovulation and it'll pass through the woman's reproductive tract. Uh, if the egg never gets ovulated, it'll be frozen in metaphase of meiosis one and simply die through atresia, okay? So a lot of eggs never get ovulated, all right? They just end up dying inside the uterus and getting reabsorbed, okay? The corpus luteum secretes progesterone and some estrogen progesterone enriches the uterine lining, the luteal phase progresses differently depending on whether you're pregnant or not pregnant. Okay? Um, if you are pregnant, what's going to happen is that there will be an implant and then there will be production of human chorionic gonadotrophin and that will maintain the corpus luteum until the end of the first trimester. Okay? If you are not pregnant, what's going to happen is that the corpus luteum will degenerate much more quickly. Okay? Um, in the uterine cycle, the phases are the menstrual, and then the proliferative, and then the secretory. The proliferative phase is dominated by the production of estrogen from the follicles and some progesterone. Right? And then the formation of the corpus luteum marks an increase in progesterone production um, and a continued thickening of the endometrium um, through hypertrophy as opposed to in the proliferative phase um, cell division. Okay?
So you can see, again, the idea here is to prepare the endometrium for the arrival of the blastocyst so it has something to latch onto and feed, right? Um, without a fertilized ovum, the corpus luteum becomes the corpus albicans uh, in under a month, okay? And then at that point, it's no longer secretory tissue. Plasma levels of ovarian hormone decline. Without hormonal support, the uterine lining, the functional layer, of the endometrium sloughs off because the spiral arteries that supply blood to it are going to constrict, cut off that blood flow, and then necrosis will kill that part of the uterus. Okay, so there'll be significant blood loss. All right, um, the uh, the trigger for that is the declining progesterone. Okay, uh, with uh, an implant, human chorionic gonadotrophin maintains the corpus luteum and through the first trimester, okay, um, the corpus luteum maintains the progesterone production and thus maintains the uterine lining. All right. After the first trimester, the placenta takes over that role, and you don't need the corpus luteum anymore, and it devolves into the albicans. Okay. So, in a non-pregnant individual, the corpus luteum will become the corpus albicans. The uterine lining loses hormonal support and sloughs off. The cycle starts again as declining ovarian hormones trigger FSH. If you're pregnant, well, let's say if you have an implant, the corpus luteum is retained for the first trimester, secreting progesterone, lots of it, and estrogen. Hormones sustain the endometrium, the early embryo implants, and develops. Okay. Female reproductive terms, menarche, we talked about. That's the first menstrual period. Menses is the last menstrual period. And menopause is a decrease in ovarian hormone. The menstrual periods decrease and eventually stop. And then there are other systemic effects. Okay. The next thing we want to jump into is birth control. We're going to talk about the different types, barrier, hormonal, surgical, IUD, and behavioral. Okay. So let's take a listen to that. Hello and welcome to Healthy Nation. I'm Pat Murphy. The human reproductive process is delicate and complex. It can seem like an absolute miracle when a new life is born. Whether you're trying to conceive or not, the key to family planning is knowledge and preparation. In this segment, we'll shed some light on how reproduction works and we'll give you some tips on how you can help guide the process. Let's go to Dr. Isabel Blumberg with an overview of how reproduction works. Each month, a woman's body goes through a cycle to prepare itself for a potential pregnancy. This cycle is called menstruation, and it lasts on average 28 days, but it can vary, lasting from 21 to 35 days. The menstrual cycle actually begins when the uterus sheds its lining through the vagina, resulting in what is commonly called your period. So the day bleeding begins is day one of your cycle. At this point, hormones from the brain trigger the development of eggs in the ovaries, which in turn produce estrogen. Only one egg fully matures within a protective sac, known as the follicle, and it continues to produce estrogen. This estrogen causes the lining of the uterus to thicken and to prepare for pregnancy. The mature egg is expelled from the ovary about 14 days after the cycle begins and starts its journey down the fallopian tube. Throughout the month, a woman's cervix produces mucus. At about the same time the egg is released, the cervix produces additional mucus. If a woman were to have sex at this point, this mucus would help nourish the man's sperm and help move them towards the egg for fertilization. If fertilization occurs, this newly formed embryo will travel down the fallopian tube to implant in the uterus and pregnancy begins. If fertilization or implantation doesn't happen, the cycle begins again, and the egg is flushed out when the uterus sheds its lining at the beginning of a new menstrual cycle. Each step of this process needs to fall into place just right for pregnancy to occur. Women hoping to conceive can increase their likelihood of getting pregnant by learning about their individual cycle and knowing which days of the month they are most fertile. If you are trying to become pregnant, you can consult your doctor. She will help determine your ovulation time and address any specific health concerns you may have. If, on the other hand, you are sexually active but don't want to become pregnant, there are many birth control options available. These include the barrier methods, 
hormonal contraceptives, IUDs or intrauterine devices, natural family planning techniques, and permanent surgical procedures. You'll want to talk to your doctor about which might be right for you and consider the risks, effectiveness, and your lifestyle. By knowing how pregnancy works and by learning about your individual cycle, you can better plan and prepare for your future. It's important to learn about your body and to know your options when it comes to family planning. For more information on pregnancy, birth control, or sexual health, watch our other segments in this area. Thank you for being a part of Healthy Nation.